ladies and uh, gentlemen, good morning to uh, the uh, very first uh, session, the base session of day three, the last day here. And uh, I see the clock is already ticking, so we might as well have a very good view of our conference. I see a few of our stars out of our day. And they leave my life on this morning. Uh, two sessions, I like. Uh, in a very the European Union and the market. And so this is, uh, this is really the end of the market. And I'm not going to be here anymore because you might have missed with all the projects on Donald Trump these days, and that is the capital of the United States. You might have missed that the European company is also going to be in the American product with them. So to talk about that, uh, about the European Union and where the company is where the union is headed, and I'm very pleased to welcome the director of the Chief of the Panel here today. Each of them will have a five minutes to have a statement, and then we'll engage in a very lively Q&A with your participation. Of course, starting with the gentleman to my left. Who, of course, is familiar to many of you, has held many, many uh, important positions, including as the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs at the State Department. He also served uh, as ambassador to Germany during a very critical time, namely from 1985 to 1989. Uh, and currently, he's the managing director of McLarty Associates, uh, based in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Richard Birds. Richard, as somebody who's American, obviously, but as I said, you served uh, in Germany as ambassador, worked on the EU uh, quite a bit. We're very curious to hear about your opening statements, to hear your take right now on the current state of the European Union. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be very brief, make a few hopefully provocative points to get a debate a discussion going with this panel and with the audience. And I think I will uh, begin by reminding some of you who at least read the Wall Street Journal of a column that showed up after a visit by Donald Trump to Europe last summer. It was written by H.R. McMaster, the President's National Security Advisor, and Gary Cohn, who chairs something called the National Economic Council. And uh, the title of the article was, uh, America First Does Not Mean America Alone. And I'm not sure whether or not I agree with that, but I do think that America first perhaps means Europe alone. I think we are going through a really crucial and historical change in which uh, the message from Washington to Europe and the EU is now you are on your own. If you think back, both through the uh, post immediate post-war period, the Cold War period, and the aftermath of the Cold War, the one kind of stabilizing uh, influence in international politics was the U.S.-European relationship. I think that is, has changed, and it's probably changed for good. If you think back on, uh, example, the kind of special relationships, not only between the United States and Britain, but the remarkable relationships that go back to the 1950s between, say, Eisenhower and, Conra and, and, and Conrad Adenauer, uh, between, uh, between uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, between, say, Tony Blair his relationships both with uh, Bill Clinton and George uh, W. Bush, and uh, the relationships more recently between leaders like Angela Merkel and Barack Obama, there is no such relationship now between any major uh, European leader uh, with Donald Trump. And I think that as American policy becomes less focused on values, Western values and shared values, and more on transactionalism. You see an emphasis in American policy on India, China, uh, East Asia, 
South Asia and not the European-American relationship. So this puts the Europeans and the EU in particular, in my view, in a difficult position. On the one hand, it's kind of a scary world for the Europeans out there without the United States as a partner. But on the other hand, it can also be a force for change in Europe, an invigorating period for Europe to take, uh, take on new responsibilities and new leadership. But uh, that fundamental shift away from the transatlantic relationship being the centerpiece of international relations is something I think that will pose real pressures and challenges for not only Brussels and the Brussels-based institutions, but, uh, but the major European players. Point two, that means, in my view, that Europe has to strengthen itself. Uh, we all recognize the importance of coming to grips with the economic challenges, of dealing with uh, fixing the, uh, the uh, European monetary system, of finding a way of dealing with some persistent uh, European issues like, like growth. Uh, and I think some progress has been made in those areas. But the one thing I would emphasize briefly this morning is the importance of strengthening and building the European defense pillar. Uh, it was interesting to me that uh, when Trump was in Europe last summer, the big debate was, well, will the Europeans agree to the 2% increase in defense? That, to me, is the wrong way to cast the issue. Europeans shouldn't think about defense spending as a way of placating the Americans. The Europeans need to think about defense spending and strengthening their defense to play a bigger role in international politics. I think there is some consensus beginning to emerge along those lines, and I think I would only, as an American, applaud an effort to strengthen European security and defense. Third point, Europe needs a strategy, a common strategy, for regulating and protecting its borders. I'm not talking here about a Trumpian wall for Europe, but I am talking about the need to have a European-wide uh, immigration strategy, one and one which is not based or, 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 uh, or uh, implemented on a national basis, but on an EU basis. I think more has to be done in this area. Uh, it's, uh, the, the problem of immigration has loomed large recently, particularly in places like Eastern Europe, and uh, only, it seems to me, a European-wide approach to dealing with con controlling the border, and protecting the border, is, uh, is the solution. And it f uh, f uh, my penultimate point has to do with the problems, if I can put it in those terms, of dealing with, uh, and I know we have a Polish representative on our, po on our panel, but I think we've got to do something, or Europe needs to do something, about the unruly Eastern Europeans. And here I'm not just pointing at Poland. I'm pointing, of course, at Hungary, pointing at some other uh, newer members of the EU in the East. But uh, some kind, of, uh, some kind of, of agreement needs to be reached in Brussels to find a way of, uh, of if I can use this word, demonstrating that there are costs associated with, uh, with not living up to the standards and rules of the European Union. Because if, if Europe, if the EU fails to do this, then I think it faces potential disintegration. And I will, I will finish my comment by saying what I am basically an optimist about Europe, and the reason I am an optimist, an optimist is, for, is for three reasons. First of all, I was very pleased to see the results of the recent German elections. I'm relieved that uh, even though there are tough coalition discussions going on in Berlin today, uh, that Angela Merkel has been returned to power. She has played a very important leadership role. And that leads to the second aspect, which is the results of elections in France. The Germans now potentially have their, a French partner, which could create a revitalized Franco-German alliance within the EU, 
which is a, has always historically been, in my view, the vital engine of growth and modernity in Europe. And that leads finally to my third point, is with all the debate and discussion, and I know my friend Steve will address this in more detail, but with all the debate and discussion with London about how Brexit is going to proceed, how the British are or are, are not going to be able to successfully negotiate leaving the EU, I secretly believe that Britain, in the end, will not leave Europe. Well, thank you, Richard. You heard it here first. Breaking news, please. Breaking news coming out of Marrakesh. Uh, Brexit no longer. We are, uh, the Great Britain is not leaving the EU. You heard it here first on the stage. Richard, uh, many, many thanks for your opening remarks, which gave us a lot of food for thought, uh, saying that the special relationship between the US and EU will not exist as it uh, used to be, perhaps an opportunity for Europe to take this opportunity uh, to become uh, more independent and grow up, if you will, particularly on the security front. And as far as Eastern Europe, we will have Bogdan Klik later on, who will get an opportunity, of course, to respond what was being said. But you mentioned a piece in the Wall Street uh, uh, Journal, a fine newspaper. Another fine newspaper is, of course, the New York Times. And that's why I'm delighted to have with us the chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe of the New York Times. I'm sure all of you are familiar with his work, with his writing. He was based, uh, amongst others, in Berlin, Paris, Moscow, London, and now currently in Brussels. Great to have him with us. Please uh, welcome Stephen Erlanger, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Now, Steve, uh, nobody needs to tell you about Europe. This is a continent that you've been covering for a very very long time. That's why I'm particularly curious to hear your take on the future of the EU. Well, thank you, Ali. I and mean, we've been all waiting for Europe to grow up for a very long time. I think I'll be dead before it reaches teenage years, but we'll see. Um, I, it's always hard to follow Rick, but I want to encourage you in one thing. If you are troubled by Donald Trump's indifference to Europe, Think how troubled you would be if he was really interested in Europe. <laughs> um, I think he's basically decided, not liking multilateral institutions, that the European Union, in his view, is silly, but if you want it, it's OK. And that's kind of the way he feels about NATO. You know, maybe it's not great, and maybe the US is being taken advantage of, but it seems important, and the people around him think it's important, so it's OK. Um, I'm very ambivalent, I would guess, right now, about the state of the European Union. I think. It has gotten some of its mojo back, there's no question. Brexit has been a prise de conscience, it's been a wake-up call. Um, it has made sure that no other country will vote to leave the EU, at least not for quite a long time. Um, it has reinvigorated the idea that Europe needs better leadership. The growth is back, though still very slow. Um, as we've heard in the excellent economic and finance panels, unemployment is, is less, but still bad, particularly for youth. The big problem, you know, remains the diversity of 28 countries. What worked at 15 does not really work so well at 28, perhaps soon to be 27, I suspect soon to be 27. But Britain was never really the problem inside the EU. It was an irritant, but not a problem. What we have is, um, and my friend Ivan Krustyev has written a little essay that got turned into a book called After Europe. His worry is not north-south, it's east-west. It is the conflict in values between eastern members, central members. Um, the one we say central, that always implies that Russia is part of um, Europe, and I'm not sure that it really wants to be or is. Um, these countries, which you know are pretty newly sovereign, 
are still very reluctant to give up that newly found, refound sovereignty to Brussels. They really oppose the idea of a stronger European institutional basis. So there's a big debate going on. If we need more Europe for the Eurozone, um, it's not clear to me that the argument is won in Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, or Slovakia. Not at all clear. They don't like the euro. They don't like Brussels. Now, to some degree, they're very pro-European. They get aid. Um, their citizens can work and travel. Um, but some of these countries, like Slovakia, which is a fascinating place. It's five, six million people. It makes more cars per capita than any country on Earth. And they're all because of EU companies. Um, it's very pro-European, yet it resists taking any migrants and resists this notion that the membership of the EU should have costs with it, not simply benefits. Now, that's a value issue, but it's also going to take quite a long time to resolve. The other thing you know, we talk about is the Franco-German couple. It's no longer enough for a Europe this size. Uh, the Germans are desperate to have a France that is in better shape, partly to share the responsibility and the blame for European leadership, because there's a lot of anti-German feeling in southern Europe and in eastern Europe, um, uh, feeling that if you think Trump is America first, Germany has been acting as Germany first within Europe for quite a long time, even though its myth is, you know, altruism. But no one in the European Union actually believes in that myth anymore. And Merkel understands that. That's part of the problem. Um, and you see it in defense, which I won't go into much because others will, but already in, in new ideas of European defense, you have a big fight between Germany and France because Germany wants a big club and France wants capabilities, not surprisingly. I mean, France wants more money spent on equipment and training, and the Germans just want a club. Um, and if you look at German opinion polls, we want Germany to do more. We want Germany to play a bigger role. Germans themselves are extremely ambivalent about doing that. Now, the last point I'll make and this one really is the last, it's not the penultimate and the third, <laughs> is Brexit. Um, I've just moved from Britain. I've spent nine years of my life there. Britain has become a country I don't even recognize anymore. Um, and its allies don't recognize it either. I've just done a piece, if you care, in today's Sunday New York Times about Britain um, and Brexit, and I, I'm just going to end by reading you the first two paragraphs, which are many Britons see their country as a brave galleon, banners waving, cannons firing, trumpets blaring. This is how the voluble Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson likes to describe it. But Britain is now a modest-sized ship on the global ocean. Having voted to leave the European Union, it is unmoored, heading to nowhere, while on deck, fire has broken out, and the captain, poor Theresa May, is lashed to the mast without the authority to decide whether to turn to port or to starboard, let alone do what one imagines she would want to do and knows would be best, which is to turn around and head back to shore. People don't recognize this Britain. We, rec you know, we think of Britain as a country of pragmatism, of common sense, political stability, uh, a nation of shopkeepers. It's become nearly unrecognizable. It's no longer the country they understood it to be their whole lives. But I do think the EU and Britain, I really hope some kind of deal will be done because Britain the trade is useful for Britain and the EU. Uh, Britain is a military power still, though very hollowed out, let's be honest. Um, and 
to imagine an EU or a Britain without some kind of decent relationship uh, shakes me to the core. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And as someone who has, as you said, lived in the UK for nearly a decade, uh, you can tell and feel when you talk about Brexit that this is something that uh, affects you also on a personal level. I'm um, very curious later on to hear from Michael Lothian, of course, uh, on Brexit. But you also mentioned correctly that Europe needs a strong France. Uh, it needs France to step up and assume its former role, if you will, to be the congenial partner of Germany anyway, which is why I'm delighted to welcome here on stage a former member of the French Parliament and the pre president of the Commission of Foreign Affairs at the French National Assembly. Currently, she's the president of the Anna Lindt Euro-Mediterranean Foundation for the dialogue between cultures. Ladies and gentlemen, delighted to have her with us, Elisabeth Guigou, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Elizabeth, both uh, Richard and Steve alluded uh, to France, of course, a very important country, a country that needs to assume its rightful place as one of the leaders of the EU if this union of 28, soon 27 nations is going to work out. That's why I'm delighted and curious now to hear from, from somebody from France who is deeply immersed and experienced in French politics about where the country is headed. Merci beaucoup. Je vais parler français, hein? je suis française, fière de ma culture. Although I have no problem in speaking English, but je parle français. Alors j'espère que tout le monde a les écouteurs. Euh, je, je voudrais commencer par dire que euh, le, le marasme européen actuel que Stephen a très très bien décrit, c'est-à-dire le fait que les divisions prennent le dessus. Et euh, la montée, spécialement en France, mais partout en Europe, du, de l'euroscepticisme, de l'euro-hostilité, et la montée du populisme, d'ailleurs, qui est un phénomène mondial, hein, mais enfin qui atteint l'Europe de plein fouet, euh, je crois que c'est lié au fait que l'Europe au fond, l'Union européenne euh, s'est construite en tournant le dos au reste du monde. Elle s'est construite de façon nombriliste, sous la pression de la nécessité, d'abord, parce que le plus urgent, après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, après ces tragédies qui avaient décimé des, des millions et des millions de jeunes gens, génération après génération, après que l'Europe ait entraîné l'ensemble du monde dans deux tragédies absolument sans précédent, enfin, la grand... nous, avons, euh, nous avions une priorité qui était la paix et la prospérité retrouvée. Alors le grand mérite, évidemment, et c'est mon premier point, il ne faut jamais l'oublier, c'est que le grand mérite de l'Union européenne, c'est d'avoir, euh, d'être devenu synonyme euh, de la paix et de la prospérité retrouvée. Ça, ça a été les 30 glorieuses 45-75. Bon. Donc euh, là, tant qu'il s'agissait d'abord de, de l'Europe occidentale, ne l'oublions jamais, euh, qui s'est qui, qui construite à l'abri de deux protections. La première, évidemment, celle de la protection américaine pour sa sécurité, de l'Alliance Atlantique, l'article 5, on y reviendra. Euh, et le deuxième, c'est que cette protection, elle, elle défendait une frontière, frontière détestable, mais qui était le rideau de fer. Mais une frontière, c'est toujours protecteur. Et donc, cette Europe-là, cette Union européenne-là, elle s'est construite comme ça. Et donc, euh, le problème qu'elle a eu, c'est que euh, elle, euh, elle a été elle n'a pas été capable, en réalité, de faire face correctement, euh, d'abord à l'effondrement de l'Union soviétique, qui a été un chaos mondial, mais spécialement pour l'Europe, parce que nous, a, nous avons été dépassés par l'histoire, euh, qui allait beaucoup trop vite, et incapables de, de penser hein, euh, les conséquences qui allaient être, euh, évidemment, euh, considérables. C'est un séisme, un chaos. 
euh, à la fois sur les pays d'Europe centrale et orientale, heureusement qui a accédé à la démocratie, hein, euh, mais les élargissements, le grand élargissement euh, de 2004 n'a pas été vraiment bien géré politiquement. Voilà. On a négocié sur le commerce, très bien, euh, parce que c'était ce que l'Europe savait faire, hein, sur l'économie. Je pense qu'on n'a pas assez parlé de valeurs, et on a ce problème maintenant, qu'est-ce qu'on partage Qu'au début, il y avait un grand enthousiasme des pays d'Europe centrale et orientale qu'il fallait accueillir parce qu'ils euh, auraient été là avec nous s'il n'y avait pas eu le rideau de fer. Mais euh, on n'est pas allé, on n'a pas eu une gestion politique hein, suffisante, en tout cas de cette affaire. Et puis surtout, on, euh, on s'est quand même accommodé euh, beaucoup trop facilement de l'effondrement de l'Union soviétique sans imaginer ce que ça allait produire ensuite sur, comme, comme humiliation, comme conséquence en Russie. Alors voilà, donc euh, je, je, je considère moi qu'une bonne partie euh, des problèmes européens, qui sont des problèmes internes ou des problèmes, des problèmes de, du futur de l'Union européenne, euh, viennent du fait qu'elle ne s'est pas tournée vers le monde extérieur. Alors, ça ne veut pas dire qu'il ne faut pas que l'Union européenne continue à se renforcer à l'intérieur, naturellement. Là, le président Macron euh, a fait... Il est le premier président depuis François Mitterrand, avec lequel j'ai travaillé pendant huit ans à l'Élysée, dont j'ai été la ministre des Affaires européennes, j'ai négocié Maastricht. Hein. Il est le premier président depuis euh, François Mitterrand à avoir mis l'Europe au cœur de son projet, à avoir gagné l'élection présidentielle en, en enfonçant Madame Le Pen sur la question de l'Europe et de l'euro. Et de cela, nous lui sommes tous évidemment euh, extrêmement reconnaissants. Sans doute que Madame Le Pen n'aurait pas été élue, mais enfin, si elle avait fait 42, 43 ou 45 au lieu de 35, ça aurait été quand même autre chose. Alors. Emmanuel Macron, il a fait des propositions parce qu'il comprend que l'Europe, ce n'est pas naturel. L'Europe, il faut des initiatives, il faut du volontarisme, un brin d'utopie même. Bon. Et en même temps, il faut du réalisme. Et ceux qui ont réussi, je veux dire, Delors, Kohl et Mitterrand, c'était ça, une vision et en même temps, le chemin pratique. Et je trouve que maintenant, euh, l'essentiel, en raison des défis qui se posent à l'Europe, le défi de l'unité, bien entendu, vous, Steven a très bien dit, hein, la question de l'immigration est devenue majeure. Euh, mais la question de l'immigration, qu'est-ce que c'est C'est la question de la sécurité, de la lutte contre le terrorisme en Afrique, quand on voit que Boko Haram achète euh, des, des gens avec des clopinettes, hein, presque rien. Bon. Euh, l'immigration, le, le, c'est une question de développement, L'immigration, c'est une question de développement soutenable. On a euh, en même temps des défis à affronter sur le climat. Donc, le principal problème stratégique aujourd'hui de l'Europe, c'est non seulement de se renforcer, et y compris sur la défense, parce que Richard a parfaitement raison de dire que maintenant, il faut que nous prenions en main nos propres affaires hein, et qu'on euh, n'a pas fini de payer l'échec de la Communauté européenne de défense en 1954, il a fallu attendre 40 ans pour que l'Union européenne dise qu'on pourrait peut-être avoir une ambition en matière de politique étrangère et de défense, c'est-à-dire le traité de Maastricht, avec des déconvenus multiples, parce que les, les, les approches sont encore très différentes. Mais comme, euh, vraiment, je, je crois beaucoup, hein, je crois que Trump nous rend service en réalité, voilà. <rire> et euh, il me semble que surtout, on, nous devons avoir une priorité stratégique absolue, l'Afrique. Arrimé, comme l'a dit récemment Emmanuel Macron, l'Europe le, et l'Afrique. Parce que nous devons affronter euh, ces défis ensemble, sinon nous ne ferons qu'accentuer le repli, le refus de l'autre euh, et en fait la confrontation. Voilà. Donc moi, c'est vraiment ce, ce que je voulais dire. Alors maintenant, un mot sur le Brexit. Euh, moi, j'espère ardemment que euh, le Royaume-Uni reviendra dans l'Union européenne. Euh, mais le peuple britannique a décidé. Alors, il est hors de question d'avoir euh, en tête une quelconque punition. C'est une mauvaise affaire, hein. mauvaise affaire pour l'Union européenne, en, une, encore plus, et une tragédie, à mon avis, hein, pour le Royaume-Uni, dont on commence seulement à voir les, euh, les effets. 
Mais je pense que si les choses continuent comme ça, et c'est un, un motif d'optimisme pour moi, les Européens, que, dont vous avez souligné les divisions, ils sont unis pour l'instant, les 27, dans la négociation sur le Brexit. Ils sont unis pour circonscrire la négociation à trois sujets du divorce. Euh, la question des ressortissants, c'est en bonne voie, très bien. Faut... Deuxièmement, la question financière, évidemment, on trouvera un compromis. Troisièmement, la question de l'Irlande, qui est peut-être la plus, la plus compliquée. Quant à la question du statut futur... Dès lors que ces problèmes sont résolus, naturellement, nous allons essayer de trouver, dès que le Royaume-Uni aura dit ce qu'il souhaite, parce que pour l'instant, pas le cas, euh, le, le meilleur compromis possible. Et surtout, il nous faut préserver nos relations bilatérales. Et en matière de défense, hein, c'est euh, évidemment avec le Royaume-Uni qu'il faut, euh, sur un plan bilatéral, arriver à trouver... Voilà. Alors moi, j'espère... Voilà, J'ai deux espoirs, mais je pense que, je pense que le contexte nous aide. Le Brexit, à mon avis, ça a ressoudé euh, les Européens. Hein euh, et comme me l'a dit un de mes amis euh, qui a, britannique, qui a longtemps été impliqué comme moi dans les négociations européennes, « Soyez durs avec nous, c'est la meilleure façon de nous faire revenir. Voilà. » euh, Deuxièmement, la stratégie vis-à-vis -vis de l'Afrique, hein, qui me paraît absolument fondamentale. Je pense que si nous faisons ça, avec les instruments, évidemment, euh, qui vont avec. Je pense que si nous faisons ça, nous retrouverons euh, un espoir européen. Voilà. Oui. Thank you, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for giving us the view from Paris, if you will, from France, also reiterating that perhaps with the new president, there might be another focus and emphasis on Europe, on France's contribution. Uh, to Europe. Also, thank you, of course, for a very passionate plea again. It's very easy to overlook if you're focusing on the day-to-day -day obstacles and problems of the EU, why the union was founded in the first place. And you pointed that out, put it in a historic context. Thank you so much. And uh, Richard, well, you might believe Brexit might not happen, but I heard at least two people up until now, both Elizabeth and Steve, who might think this process is irreversible. I'm uh, very curious now, much more than ever, to hear what the spectrum will be once we get to Michael Lothian. But Eastern Europe was mentioned, and uh, that is why I'm uh, very pleased to welcome Polish senator and the minority leader of the Polish Senate. He was also a former minister of defense of his country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bogdan Klich. Bogdan, uh, Poland's an important country, of course, one of the most populous countries uh, in the EU, has been mentioned a few times, both in a positive, but also, let's be honest, in a less favorable manner. That's why I'm uh, very curious to hear the view from Warsaw now. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, that's first, and uh, very glad also that uh, we have uh, good news uh, from this morning that there are Americans that believe in Europe. <laughs> Not only Europeans believe in the future of the European Union, but also Americans do that. So it means that uh, there is a chance for a renewal of the good partnership between Europe and, uh, and the United States. Uh, that's first. Secondly, I'm not from Eastern Europe. I'm from Central Europe. And there is a difference between Central Europe that joined NATO, joined the European Union, when the Eastern Euro Europe didn't do that. Yes, and uh, there is a huge difference also concerning the relationship to the values, the approach to the values. Such values that were at the beginning of the alliance in 1949 and at the beginning of the process of European integration. I mean democracy, the rule of law, civil liberties, uh, rights of minorities, and uh, market, uh, market economy. Central Europeans believe in those values. Central Europeans, although there are governments that are Eurosceptical and that are, let's say, undermine partially those values, Central Europeans are committed to, to this set of values, once again, Euro-Atlantic values. In my home country, 84% of people are in favor of the, of the uh, future of the European Union. 
are satisfied of our membership in the EU. So please don't make, uh, uh, and don't put in an equal position society and the current government in Poland. This is the policy of the current government in Hungary and Poland, but this is not a position of Central Europeans. Please remember about that. Now about Europe, because this is uh, what, uh, what we are talking about. Uh, we are in the European Union in a kind of paradoxical situation. Because on one hand, we are aware of, uh, of uh, deterioration of the political situation in our neighborhood. I mean, in southern and the eastern neighbor neighborhood. Eastern Europe and Mediterranean are in crisis. The first one, after the aggressive policy of the Russian Federation towards, uh, towards Ukraine, uh, we didn't expect, uh, in fact, that there will be a military invasion of Russian troops to one of the parts of uh, sovereign uh, Ukraine, especially after 1994, when the uh, Russian Federation, together with uh, Great Britain and the United States, guaranteed sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity of, uh, of that country. But it happened. But it happened. It means that Eastern Europe and uh, even more in Euro-Atlantic zone, uh, the existing model of security that was, once again, paradoxically, introduced into the strategic documents of, uh, of the alliance uh, in November 2010, I mean, cooperative model of security, was blown up was blown up by this aggression of the uh, Russian Federation because this model was based on the assumption that dialogue is much better than confrontation, that military confrontation was excluded from the vocabulary of our cooperation with, uh, with Russia. But the confrontation, uh, confrontation uh, exists, uh, and after the illegal annexation of Crimea, after uh, having so many troops, Russian troops in Donbas uh, region, after, and after uh, there is no uh, satisfying uh, solution concerning the future of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty, and after Russian Federation is not only assertive, but is aggressive power, and after Russian Federation decided to, to show its, uh, uh, its power also in the Middle East, uh, and decided uh, two years ago to go to, to the war in, uh, in Syria, and to be engaged strongly in this, uh, in this conflict, uh, we see, you know, a, a, a set of threats coming from, uh, from Eastern Europe. Similar situation is in the southern neighborhood of, uh, of Europe, although after the Arab Spring, uh, we witnessed rather uh, asymmetric uh, threats than conventional threats. But uh, right now, after four years, uh, we have the unstable uh, Mediterranean region. We have uh, uh, failed states like uh, Libya. We have a uh, recovery of uh, authoritarian military regime in uh, Egypt. And we have only two stable countries. One of them is, uh, it is Morocco. The other one, it is Jordan, that uh, are partners for Euro-Atlantic uh, community. That's why, in this uh, deteriorating uh, environment, we have to do something with our European capabilities in the sphere of uh, security and uh, defense. It means that Europe should take more responsibility for its own security, more responsibility in the area of uh, security. Now, uh, we are aware that we can deal politically with crisis, a uh, variety of crises in our neighborhood, but we are not prepared to do the same uh, using our 
military capabilities uh, because we don't have crucial capabilities uh, that uh, should be used in such uh, situations. We need more planning capabilities, we, we, we need more operational capabilities, and we need more or better coordination between civilian and military aspects of missions and uh, operations at the level of planning and at the level of conducting of uh, operations. I would say that CSDP right now needs, uh, doesn't need uh, new institutions because we have uh, enough tools, sufficient tools that were incorporated into the Lisbon Treaty. After 2009, we are aware that we have permanent structured cooperation that we can use, that we have the European Defense Agency that was, uh, let's say, uh, introduced into the treaty. We have battle groups. We have battle groups that were, uh, that were uh, prepared, but they were not used even during the crisis in Mali. Although one of the battle groups at that time was on, uh, was on duty. So we have enough institutions, but we don't have enough political will to do that. So uh, I would say, and this is my first, uh, I would say, significant uh, remark and expectations from uh, European leaders, that they will be able to sign a, a significant political message to the rest of Europe and the world that Europe is able to improve its capabilities concerning CSDP in the future. It doesn't mean that we need uh, more Europe everywhere. I'm very satisfied that you used this, uh, this, uh, this notion of more Europe because we are in different situations than uh, 20 years ago that we expected more Europe everywhere working on constitutional treaty but there are at least uh, two areas in which uh, there is a need. There is a public expe expectation of more Europe. This is uh, uh, external security and this is internal security. The citizens of the European Union believe and need more Europe. It means more integration in those two areas. And, uh, I don't want to say that uh, we need, uh, let's say, uh, uh, that it is possible to improve European capabilities uh, concerning uh, counterterrorism without uh, reviewing the treaties. Probably not. Probably it would be necessary to review the treaties and to prepare a new treaty to do it, you know, in this sphere. But we can do without changing our treaties in the European Union, renewal of our security capabilities outside. It means that CSDP, with the operational HQ, with the improvement of battle groups, uh, with the improvement of research policy of the European Union that we were working together on the study about that, uh, with uh, 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 even the new uh, battle groups concept, that the European Union is ready to do that. It is necessary to have the leadership, and I hope that after the creation of uh, the new coalition government in Germany, the Germany will be together in, uh, with uh, France in this uh, leadership of this process. I hope that after the change uh, of, of the government in my country, Poland will join this, uh, this leadership as we proposed such changes in the first and this, in the second uh, Weimar letter. I was one of uh, the authors of Weimar letters uh, uh, proposing in 2010 some of the solutions that are uh, being uh, incorporated right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bogdan, for giving us a view from Poland. Also reiterating that more than 80% of Polish citizens are very much in favor of the European Union, perhaps in stark contrast to the current administration, not to be confused 
with the politics of the current administration. Thanks for pointing that out. And of course, the reiteration and emphasis and the need for a common European defense policy, something that both Richard and Elizabeth have already alluded to. Richard, I'm sure you're quite delighted to hear Bogdan say that Europe is not just ready but willing to take its own security faith in its own hand, no longer looking toward, towards DC, uh, towards Washington, and towards the US for its uh, security. Now, many Polish citizens in the past decade or so have made their way to the UK, actually, to work there, to study and work there. That's why no mention of Brexit from, from Bogdan, but uh, of course, Brexit has come up quite a few times, as you would have expected, that's why I'm very delighted to welcome uh, here now uh, on stage a former member of the UK uh, Parliament of the Conservative Party, still a current member of the House of Lords, and the chairman of the Global Strategy Forum, a policy think tank based in London. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Lothian. <clears throat> Michael, you were listed in the program as to be confirmed, that's why I was delighted that the confirmation came in yesterday because we could not have had a debate about Brexit without uh, somebody uh, from the UK. Uh, Michael, I'm sure you took diligent notes throughout what was being said, so take it away and give us your view from the UK and from London these days. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I think it was a problem with my computer that I, I was not uh, assured to be here on the right day, but here I am anyway. Um, I've listened with great interest to what's been said. You, you just mentioned me talking about Brexit. When we talked yesterday, you said we weren't going to talk about Brexit today uh, because there were other things to talk about, and I rather endorse that. I mean, my view of Brexit, very briefly, is it's an ongoing process. It's highly complex. We could spend days talking about it. We wouldn't be any clearer at the end of it. And therefore, I rather like to think of Brexit as something that is going on with very detailed negotiations. And in the end, my general view of economics throughout my long political life is that economic water finds its own level, whatever people try to do to control the way that it flows. And I think in the end we will see Brexit achieving that too. <clears throat> but what I wanted to talk about today is why I'm here on a panel which is talking about the EU. Um, I'm here because, quite simply, we are leaving the EU, and I think there's no doubt about that, the British people have spoken, but we're not leaving Europe. And that, to me, is very essential. I'm, I'm a quarter Italian. I've got a lot major European connections. Europe is part of what I am. But that doesn't mean that the European Union is. I spent 30 years in politics talking to people across Europe who accused me, as part of the British, of being the problem in Europe, the people who are holding back Europe. Why did you just get out if you don't like it? Now we're told we, they want us to stay. And what I'm saying is we're staying in the crucial areas. But the crucial areas are very simple. Uh, Elizabeth Giegel was talking about defense and security. European defense and security without the positive contribution of the United Kingdom, I think would be a very poor option. For a start, we provide more than, I think it is, I think we provide more than anybody else in terms of military capability in NATO. And without the British contribution, any European security system would be severely lacking. We provide an enormous amount of shared intelligence. We have very sophisticated intelligence systems in the United Kingdom, not least in GCHQ, which are going to be vital in the future to the fight against terrorism. And those are where we will have a big role to play. And I think, too, in the, uh, the general area of foreign policy, Britain and Europe together, not together in the European Union, but working together, have a major role to play. Um, there's been much talk about uh, hostility during these conversations on Brexit. But to me, a future relationship without the resentment at, at integration and the fear of increasing bureaucracy could, in the end of the day, be much more productive. And I say to Stephen, he, he, he read out a description of my country and said, I don't recognize it. I didn't recognize it either. And I think I know why. It was a newspaper article, quite rightly, a newspaper man reads a newspaper article. But he then mentioned Boris Johnson. And I would remind him gently that Boris Johnson is more a journalist than he is a politician. And maybe that explains why I didn't recognize the description either. Um, I want to look instead at where we will be going after this. 
I think Richard Burt actually set us a very big challenge. He said, America is moving away. And I agree with him. And I think we, that is where we as Europeans, and I use the word Europeans, should be concentrating and looking. We need essentially to change our philosophy. As Europeans, whether it's the EU or generally, we've got to stop being also rans to the American uh, policies. We've got to start defining our own policies. Of course, we'll have common interests and so we'll work together. But in the end, we have an enormous role to play on our own. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East over the last um, 20 years, and the number of times people of all sorts in the Middle East said to me, why can't the Europeans deal with us directly, rather than always as part of the quartet and always under the American umbrella? And I feel that very strongly. I think we have a major role to play if we're prepared to disassociate ourselves, not, not completely, but in terms of the policies of reconciliation and conflict resolution from that which the Americans are pursuing. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East at the moment, Yemen, this terrible crisis in Yemen, we have a role to play. And I think it's a role which should be being played much more widely, but it's not. The United Nations has the principle of the protection of responsibility to protect. And I look at what's happening in Yemen at the moment, where thousands of people are dying, many more than would have died in Libya had we not gone in. And where is, where is the responsibility to protect? Why aren't we as Europeans trying to deliver that, to say that we can actually salvage something from this mess? And when you look again at what's happening in the, the general Sunni Shia conflict, uh, we are still, because we are under the ambit of the United States, so I may say so, we're still taking sides. Now, you do not resolve conflicts like that by taking sides. You have to, I once used the analogy that if you want to referee a game, you, you, you have to be open to both sides. If you take one side, you're cheering from the sidelines. And I think that's a very important element of where we as Europeans could be playing a genuine role in terms of what could be the biggest conflict of our lifetimes in the future. And the last one is what we hear about all the time, North Korea. We hear of the dangers. But you know, um, we hear the rhetoric. I heard more rhetoric this morning. Little Rocket Man is now being conflicted by Big Rocket Man, if I may say so. And we're getting nowhere except the situation is getting more and more dangerous. We should be able to say, first of all, this is not a fight in which we have a dog. And therefore, we're not going to get involved directly in what is happening at the moment. But if it comes to conflict, we have a major interest, because the, uh, the results of that conflict could impact upon us all. And we need to be thinking very carefully about how Europe can position itself to make sure that that conflict is less likely rather than more likely. And there is one other element I just want to mention, because it's an old uh, canard of mine. If we are going to play a real role in achieving reconciliation and peace in the world, we have to change the United Nations Security Council. You cannot have a world order that is governed by people who are selected on the basis of the uh, situation at the end of the last world war, and where one country has a veto and can stop any sensible decision being taken forward. And that's a major challenge, but we in Europe should be playing a major role in trying to move towards that. And then finally, I want to look at where we go next in the world. Um, there are new opportunities, I think, uh, Richard Burt said this, new opportunities for the EU and the UK in the world. And what I see is that, I used to be a historian, that the smooth flow of history is often interrupted by periods of substantial change. And that politicians who naturally react to that by saying, we mustn't allow our, our comfortable positions to be interrupted, resist that. But in the end, change happens. And if we are going to be genuinely constructive, we have to accept that change and we have to work with it. Uh, the, other t the integration of the EU, which is what uh, President Macron has talked about, may, may be an essential part of that change. But it has to be the right sort of change. It can't just be returning to the rigid structures of the EU. It has to be an EU with a new vision. And that vision is still, I have to say, lacking. One of the keys to the change we're seeing around us in the world at the moment is the growth of anti-establishment feeling. You look at all these political results, there's one common factor, and that is that people are voting against the establishment. And we have to say to ourselves, why is that? It's not just particularly amongst the young. 
really the reason is that all these people who are anti-establishment are fed up with the old order. It's not enough for us to say, leave it to us, normal order will be resumed as soon as possible, as they used to say on television. People don't want normal order to be resumed. They want change. And that change has to come through ideas and vision. And that is what, at the moment, our world is lacking. And I see in Europe the real vibrancy that can create that vision for the future. We had a, a playwright who wrote many years ago these words, which were quoted, I think, by Bob Kennedy in, many years ago in America. Some men see things that are and ask why. I dream of things that have not been and ask why not. And I think it's time that Europe started asking why not. Thank you so much uh, to Michael Lothian, former uh, UK member of uh, the Parliament. Interesting enough, uh, ending with a quote by Robert Kennedy and not Winston Churchill, uh, as I think it's always fitting uh, for a UK man. But um, I think it's very interesting what you pointed out, namely that Great Britain is leaving the European Union, but not Europe per se. Now, that, of course, is an important message. We will see how that plays out in uh, reality, in a sense, uh, interestingly enough, pointing out that perhaps, Stephen, Europe should be grateful for Brexit because now the UK is no longer holding the process of unification, true unification, uh, uphold. But if I understood you correctly, to dash any hopes is the British people have spoken and Brexit is final. This is what I heard you say. So for all of you, not just on the panel, but in the audience, hoping for a reverse coming from Michael Lothian. That's not going to happen. Now, I'm very happy that this panel is not just composed of Europeans, uh, so not as a therapeutic session, if you will, self-referential session, but also uh, looking, uh, you know, emphasizing on the look from abroad on Europe, and that's why I'm delighted to have with us the president of the Okamoto Associates, He's also a former special advisor to two Japanese prime ministers and a former Korea diplomat. One of his posts uh, took him also as ambassador to Paris, so he knows Europe very well. Delighted to have him with us, Yukio Okamoto, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Yukio, you heard uh, many Europeans and non-Europeans talk about their current state. Uh, I, I hope it didn't put you in too much of a depression. Uh, you know, but we are very eager, of course, to hear from one of the leading nations in Asia how Europe is being perceived over there. Is it still uh, a force to be reckoned with? Is it still an element that can play a vital role in international affairs? Uh, very curious to hear the perspective from Japan. Well, thank you, Mr. Aslan. Um, well, thank you for including the dimension of Japan-EU relationship to this uh, panel. Um, my depression does not come from your talks, but uh, from the way we look at uh, the future of the world. Uh, from the Japanese point of view, at least uh, for many Japanese, the future of the world looks quite bleak, uh, gloomy, uh, sometimes uh, even oppressive with uh, three di dictators going to influence the world affairs for a long time. Uh, both Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, I believe, uh, will change their internal rules to be able to stay there even after their expected uh, uh, term. Mr. Putin uh, will, of course, uh, win the next year's election by landslide. Uh, but will he step down in 2024? I don't think so. Uh, he may change the rule to be able to stay till uh, 2030, because he will be only 71 uh, when 2024 comes. Uh, Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, he has already made his uh, move clear that uh, he's not going to be bound by the internal party rule of uh, stepping down after 10 years. Uh, so uh, from 2022, the party 20th convention till uh, 21st convention of uh, 2027, he'll be there. Uh, Mr. Kim Jong-un, uh, unless he's eliminated, will be there for 30, 40 years. And uh, we have uh, territorial 
disputes from all these uh, uh, countries. And uh, we even feel that uh, the world order, uh, which we have uh, uh, endeavored so hard to build uh, in 20th century uh, based on the common universal value, may come to uh, a, an erosion. Um, and uh, looking at the United States, uh, we are going to have a quite unique um, president. Uh, I said uh, <clears throat> Mr. Trump will be a good pre president for Japan, but uh, will he be a good president for the world? I don't know. Um, it remains to be seen. But uh, the past record uh, does not uh, encourage us uh, very much listening to his inaugural speech. And then the past uh, uh, United Nations General Assembly speech this past uh, uh, September, where he essentially said that uh, the United States will only mind uh, its own business and all the countries should do the same, will be the shining example. Now, who are going to look after the public goods? So I have been uh, campaigning in Japan uh, everywhere that uh, now uh, Japan should be really one of the uh, banner bearers to uh, support uh, the public goods um, and departing from the diplomacy of uh, rhetorics. And uh, who in the world can we partner with? There's only EU. EU is the best partner for Japan to do uh, this new uh, campaign. Um, first of all, uh, Europe is uh, uh, sharing the common destiny in terms of security uh, with Asia. If, uh, uh, as Mr. Uh, Lucian said, uh, Kim Jong-un shoots uh, his missiles uh, westbound, it will uh, cover the entire Europe uh, very soon. Um, we are in one unity. We don't have to wait for the ambitious plan of uh, one belt, uh, one world uh, concept of China. Um, Economic uh, dimension, uh, we have so many complementariness. Uh, we both lack resources, uh, and the efficient use of uh, natural resources is uh, incumbent upon uh, Japan and Europe. There are a lot of other complementariness, uh, which I will leave it to a smart international relations student. Uh, anyone can tell you that. But so, in the remaining uh, minutes, I am going to say something uh, uh, other people uh, will never say. Uh, that is, it will benefit uh, Japan greatly to uh, partner with the uh, EU. Uh, but uh, uh, have we come really to the reconciliation with Europe? Uh, we have not. Uh, been able to settle the issue of uh, POW with the uh, United Kingdom, not with the uh, Netherlands. Um, and uh, we have not uh, created a new era with uh, Germany. Uh, there was an interesting uh, BBC research done two years ago asking Japanese and uh, German people, uh, do you like uh, Germany, do you like Japan? And, uh, you know, Japanese love Germans. Uh, they consider Germany to be the uh, war partner. Uh, we fought the war together. And uh, close to uh, half the population answers. Uh, we have uh, mainly um, positive view about uh, Germany, as against only 3% saying uh, we have a mainly negative view about Germany. Now, the same uh, public opinion poll in Germany tells diametrically opposite result, uh, with only 20-some percent of Germans saying uh, uh, they have uh, mainly positive uh, view about Japan. But uh, those people who have mainly negative view about Japan, you know how many? 46% uh, as against Japan's 3%. Um, I don't know, my conjecture is that uh, still many Germans think 
that uh, Japan uh, is uh, uh, the partner of uh, Nazis uh, who brought uh, the country to destruction. And uh, Japan has uh, a partial responsibility in that. Um, I think uh, we have to really um, make uh, our uh, current uh, set of values clear to German people. But uh, the blame should fall also on us. Have we been squarely facing with the past? Uh, why have we not come to the reconciliation with uh, uh, other Asian nations? Um, of course, we have our uh, own positions. We have been apologizing over and over again to Asian countries. The war reparation um, from late uh, 1950s to 60s amounted to almost 30% of our national budget. Uh, but no matter what we do, we are not really uh, being forgiven, especially by China and uh, Korea. My, I teach at the university, my students are uh, asking, Mr. Okamoto, how long do we have to keep apologizing? Uh, and I understand them, I'm sympathetic to them, because it's not uh, uh, even the doings of their grandfathers. It, it's something done by their great-grandfathers, or sometimes great-great-grandfathers, but they have to live with the shackles of uh, uh, the past uh, uh, sin for many, many years. Uh, and looking at uh, Europe, I mean, the, the amount of, uh, uh, the level of reconciliation you've reached is uh, very impressive. And uh, I think uh, uh, it is incumbent on Japan to really uh, reform our education system. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the textbooks. I tell you, I read uh, all the 27 textbooks uh, uh, taught in high schools, but they are fair. But uh, they're not really uh, taught to students uh, in an obligatory manner. Uh, we have to do that. Uh, and okay. we have to uh, make uh, this uh, uh, repentance and our resolution uh, clear to uh, generations, um, to future generations. And uh, I think uh, uh, what uh, we will learn in dealing with uh, uh, Europe, uh, especially EU, uh, will really help us to acquire the new uh, dimension, how we can transcend the past, uh, to come to grips with the past, and through the collective wisdom uh, to approach uh, the final reconciliation uh, in Asia. Yeah. I think that's what uh, we are going to benefit from our uh, union. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Yukio Okamoto saying that uh, Europe uh, is and remain a vital pillar for uh, relationships, uh, not, just in not just in political terms, but also security terms and uh, looking at the reconciliation process that still needs to be furthered between Japan and the European continent. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the clock is ticking. I see we have approximately 12 minutes left for a Q&A, which of course is preposterous. This session started 15 minutes late, so usually we're supposed to have at least uh, close to 30 minutes of Q&A, and uh, Richard is very adamant of, of taking that time. So uh, I, I, I already have individuals in the audience, uh, and, and in the interest of time, I will collect questions and would ask you kindly, it would help if you would address your question perhaps to one panelist in particular, so we know where to go. This gentleman in the second row had his hand up first. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you, Hervé Mariton, former French MP. Uh, one quick question, mainly uh, to Michael. Uh, you didn't uh, talk much about NATO, so if you were to have a stronger position of Europe uh, on defense, uh, what does it mean uh, as the uh, evolution of NATO goes? That could also be addressed to Bogdan. Quick question to Richard and Stephen. Uh, you're very enthusiastic about Europe. Nonetheless, the Brits voted for Brexit. The last popular vote in France was a no vote in 2005. I voted yes, but the majority voted no. Many in Eastern Europe actually criticized the way Europe goes. Would you, each of you, make one proposal 
of uh, concrete evolution in the way Europe could work. All right, thank you. Can you pass on the mic uh, to the lady behind you? Thank you. And then moving it. Dernier Khatib, ma question est pour Madame Guigou. Vous avez parlé que l'Europe doit être plus impliquée dans les, les affaires du monde et vous avez parlé du, de, la politique, de, de la politique envers l'Afrique. Que pensez-vous l'Europe doit faire avec la crise au Moyen-Orient, précisément envers la Syrie, en vue que le flux de réfugiés s'abat sur l'Europe uh, I have a small comment also to Mr. Lothian. You said about the Shia Sunni divide, this is something I've researched thoroughly. I don't think not to have a, a open to both sides, I don't think the West should get involved at all. This is something the Muslim ulama, the centers of Islam like Azhar and Najaf should reconcile among each other. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the gentleman here in the second uh, row, please. I'm Chol Gijiu, former ambassador to Morocco, France, and former senior advisor to Korean president. Uh, in 1995, we launched the Asia-Europe summit process. Uh, we, did, uh, we did it with the belief that uh, it might uh, contribute to making the world better. It was done through initiative of President Chirac and uh, Prime Minister Ko Chok of Singapore. And uh, then uh, biennial summit meeting is con uh, continually held. Uh, but uh, even though we have the pillar of discussion on the value, I, I, I wonder whether the process, the existing platform is properly used. In times of crisis like this, where we should you know, discuss the refugee issue, North Korea nuclear, you know, many others, we have to discuss. But uh, some in level sometimes good for meetings of leaders, but uh, seem a little bit, little bit lackluster in terms of producing concrete results and exchange of ideas. So maybe intellectuals can join in that process. I hope very much that uh, in the uh, ASEAN process now we have uh, India and Pakistan beyond uh, China and Japan and Korea and ASEAN, of course. So we'd better valorize and use the existing platform to discuss common challenges. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's take in a couple of more questions. You have the microphone. I haven't forgotten you in the last row. Merci, je vais parler en français. Et pour Elisabeth Guigou, euh, j'ai retenu une idée intéressante, c'est que l'Union européenne s'est définie par rapport à ses frontières. Euh, Est-ce que ceci n'a pas amené l'Union européenne, de temps en temps, à tourner le dos à la Méditerranée et donc à faire perdre aussi à la Méditerranée sa centralité nécessaire Euh, certes, il euh, y a une, cette belle conclusion, Afrique-Europe, mais est-ce que actuellement, avec le retour de la croissance, avec euh, les discours Macron, avec euh, les initiatives peut-être de Merkel, ça n'est pas le moment de se réconcilier avec une frontière, parce que tourner le dos à la Méditerranée, d'après moi, ça a été avant tout aussi au détriment de l'Europe. Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, gentlemen. My name is Stan Gozon, Capgemini. A question uh, regarding immigration. Uh, Richard Burt told us that EU should define a strategy for migration and immigration. Question to the panel. What is the likelihood that within a year, let's say when we meet for the 11th edition of this World Policy Conference, this strategy has been defined, number one, and second, its execution has started effectively? Right, thank you so much. Uh, last question, the floor is yours. Daniel Dayan of the Central Bank of Romania. Two questions. First one to Michael Lothian. When you say that the UN, the governments of the UN should, should change because it's, it reflects it's a leg there is a legacy problem. More clearly, what do you have in mind, basically? Okay. Secondly, Merkel Macron, okay, the key tandem. But what is the critical mass in terms of visions? We should help the union redeem itself and, and move forward. Because they, they may not be kindred spirits when it comes to very concrete steps. Thank you so much. Now, wide variety of questions to uh, uh, many of you. Uh, Richard, uh, some of you were addressed to you uh, personally. Also take this as an advantage for final remarks uh, as we go through the row uh, and then wrap the session up. Richard. Well, I, I'll make a, just a couple of quick comments. First of all, I detect in, in many of the questions 
the kind of persistence of what I would call Euro-pessimism. Now, if we were here a year ago, we would all be wringing our hands about the threat of populism. We'd be worried about, uh, about uh, Marie Le Pen in France. We'd be worried about what was uh, the AFD in Germany. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Bill Drozdiak, has, wrote a book that's just been published. Unfortunately, he wrote it six months ago. It, it was called Fractured Continent. People aren't talking really anymore about a truly fractured continent. We know about Brexit. We know about Catalonia. But uh, I think there is a new optimism. And I think the optimism does go directly to Merkel on the one hand and Macron on the other. And there will have to be a grand bargain there. As far as I understand Emmanuel Macron, he is laying out in a kind of brilliant, exciting way, a kind of Kennedy-esque way, a vision for Europe. And it's a, it's a vision based on putting a Europe, Europe first. And it's also a vision based on finding a way to reform and, and, and strengthen European EU institutions, including the, the European monetary system. The big question for a long time has been, is, are the Germans ready to come in, be brought along? Are the Germans prepared to make the necessary financial concessions to make Europe work? Now, the Germans will never agree on a transfer union, but Merkel in the campaign made some comments and has said that I think that there is a new willingness to think about reforms, uh, particularly of the monetary system, of creating what, what Europe, in my judgment, genuinely needs, which is a common fiscal strategy. And maybe the fact that Wolfgang Schäuble will not be the finance minister in the next German government means that there may be some more flexibility there. So I'm fundamentally optimistic about reinventing this, this German, French-German axis within Europe, the motor that's important or necessary to make, uh, to make Europe work. There was, uh, last comment, there's this question about, gee, can you come up with one idea for changing Europe? And my, I, I think I mentioned it. I do, I do think that uh, immigration is a, is, has, has already been demonstrated to be a serious danger to, uh, to European unity. And we saw that in very stark terms, in terms of how different nations, and I have to say the nations of Central Europe responded to the problems of immigration. I think historically it's understandable. These were countries that weren't as cosmopolitan, if you will, as, uh, as Western European countries. They were under, uh, under Soviet domination. Uh, they, they, they didn't have the, uh, the experience and the openness that uh, Western European countries had, and they responded, uh, uh, they responded uh, in a predictable way. But I think if a European-wide approach an EU-wide approach, not a national approach, if it can be worked out, is necessary. Because another crisis in the Middle East, a crisis in North Africa, could just re, could reemerge and create the new set of strains that would be very counterproductive to what I see as the very positive trends that are alive, alive and well in Europe today. Thank you, Richard, uh, for your assessment. And uh, interestingly enough, of course, pointing out German leadership, uh, Germany's role in uh, moving forward. Uh, this is a panel, not too many people, not too many panels these days on the future of Europe without a German on the panel. But uh, uh, we have, well, I'm the moderator. I'm the moderator. So, you know, we have six panelists as is. I won't chime in here. But uh, I know that German leadership, I think, is talked about much more outside of Germany than it is within Germany, interestingly enough. But except, Steve. Except let's call it Franco-German leadership. There right? you go. I, I'm sure Elizabeth would have corrected me uh, by the time uh, it's her turn. But first, Steve, uh, uh, you may not be German, but of course you're a German expert. Uh, there, there were a couple of questions I think that uh, you, you are very uh, astute to address. OK. I'll be 
quick about this. I mean, certainly the existential panic that led to the Bratislava summit has calmed down. There's no question. And at least the European Commission is willing to take more political risk, whether it, you know, they can come to a common asylum policy, I doubt, partly because it's such a matter of um, national issues. But three, not just one proposal, three proposals, <laughs> very quick proposals. One, the problem isn't immigration, qua immigration, the problem is loss of control. The problem is the sense of uncontrolled immigration. Right. And there is now more Ordnung. There's more order to it. Even in Germany, I think that issue is calming down. The problem in Central Europe is being told what to do by Brussels on this issue or other issues. So three, one, frontier. Schengen has to have external frontiers that work. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Frontex, actually, which has a new name that I forget, is getting a lot more money. Um, it, and it is doing more. I think that's really important. Second, Greek debt has to be forgiven, at least big chunks of it. The Germans are going to have to swallow that down. It's just it's unsustainable. It's ridiculous. You can't have a, a, a stable Europe, a stable euro otherwise. And three, my other suggestion is that council meetings of country leaders should begin with breakfast and not with dinner. It would make a tremendous difference, I think, to the quality of the decision making. Um, on Merkel, Macron, I mean, I, I respect quelle audace for Macron. What audacity, quite extraordinary. I think his speech was very good, but a little too early, because the Germans hadn't yet figured out a government. And I think he should have done more coordination, not just with Madame Merkel, but with the countries of Central Europe, too, who rather resented the speech, um, because they felt left out of it. Um, and you know, we'll see. I mean, I've just looked at a bunch of um, poll figures done by the Kurber Foundation from Germany. And um, we want a lot from Germany. I'm not sure Germans want to give us what we want. I mean, they, yes, they like more European defense, but they don't want to spend any money for it. They will not, I mean, half of Germans will think they should not come to the aid of a NATO member if it were attacked by Russia, half. That's Article 5, and yet 85% of Germans believe the US will come to their aid if necessary. So there's an ambivalence and a schizophrenia which is historical and lasting and has not yet been resolved. Th thank you, Steve. And we will, of course, uh, continue to look forward to your astute observations in the New York Times about the current state and future state of uh, the EU. Now, Elizabeth, there were a couple of questions directed to you personally, so please go ahead. Oui, merci. Uh, D'abord, uh, Macron, Merkel. Je pense que ça peut donner une nouvelle impulsion. Pourquoi Parce que Macron a décidé de faire des réformes et que l'Allemagne presse la France de faire ses réformes internes depuis longtemps. Et la deuxième chose, c'est que pour la première fois, me semble-t-il, depuis la chute du mur de Berlin, l'Allemagne a besoin de la France. Elle a besoin de la France justement pour ses questions de sécurité, de terrorisme et euh, aussi de maîtriser ensemble les mouvements de population. Euh, Steven a raison. Le problème, ce n'est pas que ça existe, parce qu'on en a besoin, en plus, de l'immigration. L'Allemagne est, est dans un déclin démographique terrible, bien plus encore que les autres pays européens. Le problème, c'est l'organisation des migrations. Et vous avez raison, le devoir d'accueillir les réfugiés. C'est un, un devoir euh, non seulement moral, mais c'est un devoir du droit international. Donc on doit poser cette question euh, entre Européens. Donc ça veut dire que, bien sûr, il faut que l'Union européenne continue à se renforcer, euh, mais euh, vraiment, à ce, on ne peut pas tout faire au niveau de l'Union européenne. Il euh, y a beaucoup de choses 
énormément de choses qui doivent être de la responsabilité des États-nations membres de l'Union européenne. Ce que l'Union européenne doit faire, c'est d'aider les Européens à affronter davantage les défis globaux. Dans un monde global, il y a des défis globaux qui ne peuvent pas être relevés simplement isolément. Alors, à partir de là, la question de la sécurité est évidemment centrale. Et il, y a, il faut que nous, nous arrivions... On n'a pas le temps aujourd'hui, mais enfin, il faut approfondir un peu les choses. Parce que euh, Trump nous rend service en disant euh, « Prenez vos responsabilités ». C'est vrai. Mais ça n'est pas demain matin que l'Union européenne va pouvoir remplacer euh, le parapluie américain et l'article 5, et la garantie de l'article 5. C est, c est, je veux dire, c'est complètement irréaliste. Donc, il faut sans doute recentrer l'Alliance atlantique sur sa vocation initiale, qui est de protéger hein, le continent européen et pas d'aller s'éparpiller partout. Et en revanche, comme l'a dit très bien Bogdan, de, donner, de faire en sorte que l'Union européenne puisse assumer mieux... Euh, la, 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 la sécurité à la fois euh, avec son voisinage. Alors, nous savons très bien qu'il n'y a, a jamais de solution militaire, que les interventions extérieures finissent toujours par provoquer des réactions négatives, voire de futurs conflits. On l'a vu avec l'Irak. Donc, il faut évidemment... Les, les battle groups, hein, ce n'est pas ça qui va défendre la Pologne contre la Russie, si jamais il y avait une... une les battle groups, ils sont faits pour... Euh, bon. Donc nous avons besoin vraiment d'approfondir cette question-là, c'est-à-dire entre Européens, d'abord d'avoir une vraie industrie d'armement européenne. Si on n'a pas d'industrie d'armement, ce n'est même pas la peine de penser. Bon. Et puis d'avoir une stratégie euh, commune. Alors maintenant, je viens à l'immigration, parce que c'est vrai que c'est un, un énorme souci, la, la, non, la, la non maîtrise. Je veux dire, d'abord, pour moi, même si dans l'urgence, il faut évidemment... Euh, renforcer nos frontières, bien sûr. D'ailleurs, c'était prévu dès le départ et on ne l'a pas fait. Comme pour l'euro, il était prévu qu'on fasse une union économique, on ne l'a pas fait. Donc, il faut enfin faire ce qu'on aurait dû faire depuis maintenant une vingtaine d'années. Mais à ces solutions urgentes, ne répondront pas. Je veux dire, quand des gens risquent leur vie pour traverser la Méditerranée... Euh, ils, ils passeront de toute façon. Donc il faut le développement. C'est des solutions à moyen terme. Je ne vois pas comment nous pouvons résoudre cette question-là euh, sans, comme le disait très très bien Fatala Walalou, si nous continuons à considérer que la Méditerranée est une frontière. La Méditerranée doit être un, 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 un pivot pour organiser une coopération, un partenariat entre l'Europe et L'Afrique et le Moyen-Orient. Je, je ne... Parce que la Méditerranée, c'est le Maghreb, mais c'est aussi... Euh, voilà. Alors, je, je, je crois que euh, nous ne nous en sortirons pas autrement. C'est la raison pour laquelle il me semble que notre principal objectif doit être d'avoir une vision pour l'organisation du continent européen dans ce monde éclaté qui est devenu encore plus incertain avec Donald Trump et l'organisation du continent européen. On n'a pas beaucoup parlé de la Russie, on aurait dû, mais enfin, on n'a plus le temps. Mais l'organisation de ce continent est se tourner davantage vers le sud. Franchement, c'est là. L'Europe a réussi quand elle a trouvé des réponses aux peurs au lendemain de la guerre. Aujourd'hui, l'Europe doit trouver des réponses ensemble aux peurs du moment qui sont liées à la globalisation. Thank you, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Now, uh, they are telling me in uh, uh, no diplomatic terms that the session is over. Uh, but, uh, and I know that uh, Yokio Okamoto, you have to catch a flight. So uh, why, don't you, why don't you go ahead? It's, uh, we won't uh, hold it against you. Uh, we don't want, to miss, uh, want you to miss your flight. And uh, Bogdan and Michael, if I could ask you to be very, very brief uh, so uh, we can we can wrap uh, up the session. Yes, go ahead, please. Ju ju just one word before I leave. Uh, uh, U EU has been always regarded by Asians, especially by Japan, as a, an anchor of uh, conscience and stability. And uh, it's so sorry to see Britain leave. All right. Nice to see you. <laughs>
Now, that's what I call a graceful exit. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> th thank you so much, uh, Mr. Okamoto. Have a safe flight back thank to you. Tokyo. Michael and Bogdan, yeah. let, let's be brief. Three very short uh, answers to three very succinct, succinct questions. First of all, NATO. I didn't talk about NATO because NATO dilutes the argument about European security. First of all, if America is not part of NATO, there is no NATO. And so we're looking at something, a different animal. Secondly, the last time that NATO Article 5 was invoked was in relation to self-defense in relation to 9-11 in Afghanistan, out of area. And we, we begin to dilute the argument about European security when we bring NATO in. Second, Shia Sunni. I agree, it would be much easier not to take sides. But the Sunni, Arte, they do have the backing of a majority of the West. And the Shia feel very strongly about that. And I think we have a role in Europe where we could rebalance that slightly and give a certain reassurance which would be useful. Thirdly, the United Nations. I could write a book about this, so I'm not going to deal with it at length. But basically, we have a system in the United Nations Security Council where one permanent member can say no, and that becomes the world order. And we need to get to a situation where there's a better judgment of what is in the world's interest rather than the interest of one nation, and we need to be able to get there. Just one final comment. Uh, I keep on hearing everybody's reassured this year because after last year's concerns about the advance of the far right, it didn't happen. I wasn't here last year, and maybe I didn't get that feeling. But what I must say is this. From Britain's perspective, watching, what was it, 25% of the French voting for Marine Le Pen, watching 20% or whatever it was in Germany voting for the far right, watching this movie across Europe, that is scary enough. That these countries are prepared to invest their electoral strength in movements like that. And I think we make a great mistake if we, if we become complacent about All it. Right, thank, you. thank you, Michael. Terry is waiting in the wings, and you know he can be very persistent. 60 seconds, Bogdan. 60 seconds, OK. <laughs> it's a, it's very good, uh, it was a very good question about, uh, about NATO. We haven't forgotten about, uh, about NATO. And uh, uh, this panel was about the uh, abilities of the European Union to react in the sphere of security. That's why we didn't talk about NATO. But uh, very briefly. I'm satisfied, you know, with uh, both the uh, results of uh, Newport and uh, Warsaw Summit concerning uh, reinforcement of the eastern flank of the alliance. Yeah? Enhanced uh, uh, forward presence and tailored forward presence. These were good solutions, and they were and are still consequently implemented. So implementation of those uh, decisions is, uh, uh, goes, uh, goes, goes uh, in the right way. That's first. Secondly, there was a crucial decision of the Warsaw Summit, this declaration between the EU and NATO, signed together by uh, SecGen of NATO and uh, both uh, Juncker and Tusk uh, on behalf of the European Union, on the cooperation between, between those two entities. It is necessary to enhance cooperation between the EU and NATO in the sphere of security. Without that, we cannot speak about a better feeling of uh, security in Europe. And thirdly, I have a feeling, you know, that uh, we should work within NATO on the strategy concerning the southern flank, because the strategy concerning the eastern flank uh, during the summit in, uh, in Warsaw was presented in a, in a very clear and visible way. But to protect uh, the protection of uh, the, the, the southern uh, border of, uh, of uh, Europe was not it consisted only on some elements. We should work on comprehensive strategy within NATO, how to reinforce and to protect the Southern uh, uh, Alliance uh, border. Right. So, thank you. La ladies and gentlemen, surprisingly, we weren't able to address and solve all problems within 90 minutes of uh, the European Union, but I think we were able, this spectacular panel was able to give you a lot of food for thought, particularly after the Trump panel yesterday, building up on what was being said yesterday about the future of the, EU, uh, of the US, now focusing on the future of the EU. Thank you so much for your active participation, but particularly for the spectacular panel. Thank you so much. Thank you.